I don't play this game.
football games. So hopefully everybody will be able to come to that with us. And that's all I have for now on our um, on our schedule. Uh, looking ahead on Rob and God's Kids, we still need people to sign up for treats on the 6th and the, uh, the 13th. So if you are able to do that, please look at, this, look at that and sign up. Birthdays and anniversaries. Today is Louie's birthday, so if you can, give him a call or send him a note or something. Let him know we're thinking of him here. And I believe we have coins for him. He mailed in his eight nines. And on, I should say, and on the 7th is Steve Carlson's birthday, so make sure you see him around to give him a happy birthday as well. Direction we want to go with our church. It felt like that a little bit. Like, hey, if you're really hurting, you could just zoom this pastor. But maybe they were meeting, you could zoom home. I don't know. I didn't really know. Morning. How are you? Hey, cutie. How are you? Good. Can I have a hug? I love you. Yes. I was talking to Linda. Oh, are they for me? Did you get, did you read these? 
I think as you make your way back Corky or Patty put them in there. Okay, so that's how she knew about it from Rocky. Okay. The mighty one, God the creator, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. God comes and does not keep silence. Speak to us, God, for we are listening. And our praise hymn this morning is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's number 260. We 
shelter of your infinite mercy and pray for your grace. By your Holy Spirit, increase our knowledge of you and your will and make us obedient to you so that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty God has had mercy on us and given us his only Son to die and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become children of God and has given them the Holy Spirit. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved. Grant this, Lord, to all. Amen. Thanks be to God.
One day, Jesus was teaching in the temple and to all the people who were gathered there, and a group of religious leaders began to ask him tricky questions, trying to embarrass him. So that people who would, were, who would not, so the people who were there would not listen to his teaching. Because they were jealous of how popular he was. One of the men asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And which one do you think Jesus said? Which was the, mo the most important. The very first one. Love God. He said, Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the greatest what song do you think I've been singing? That's right. The one we've been Matthew 22. What is it? That's right. That's the one I've been singing all day. We've been singing that in kids or in uh, Rock and God's kids, and we do have a concert coming up. So if you're curious about that song, keep an eye out for that. <laughs>
Way stretching and the tide will flow. It's an angry sea, there is no doubt. But the lighthouse moon shining out, worn out of all the sailor. Lightning strikes and the wind comes cold through the sinner's bones. To the sailor's soul, there's nothing left he can hold except the rolling ocean. I am ready for the storm. Yes, sir, ready. I Thank 
be to God. There was a power couple with the highest type A personalities. They were super smart, organized, and driven. They sped through their days getting more done in a month than most of us do in two years. That is, until one member of the couple in their early 40s at the time got cancer. And it was a scary, catch it late, don't know whether you'll make it or not kind of cancer. Surgeries, chemo, and radiation ensued for months. And thank God it worked. After his recovery, he was a changed man. More so, they were a changed couple. Their type A driven pace had crashed into the cement wall of their mortality. Life and time is limited, even when you're young. It caused them to reevaluate. Was working at a breakneck pace really the way God wanted them to spend it? Grateful beyond measure for their second chance, they slowed down. They divested themselves of many of their business interests to spend more time together. They traveled with their daughter. Their once year aboard of obligatory family phone calls became regular connections. In short, they stopped and smelled the delicious, poignant, technicolor scent of roses and vowed they'd never be so busy again. This shift from high octane type A lifestyle to a much slower one, maybe all the way down to a type H, lasted about a year, maybe two. With cancer checkups showing no reoccurrences, health stabilized, and mortality once again regulated to the back burner rather than the inevitable, their pace intensified back to pre-cancer levels. When confronted by a worried family member about their vow to never be so busy again, the couple could only smile sheepishly and concede, I know, I know. Thanksgiving can be intense in the aftermath of a crisis. Receiving a reprieve from the impending doom of loss of life, limb, or loved one, and filled with relief and gratitude, a near brush propels us to change our lives for the better. This gratitude is real, it's bone, flesh, and gasping for air, visceral. Authentic as it is, it may not last because the over-the-top gratitude is too intense to embody at all times and in all places. Eventually, those endorphins and adrenaline settle back down to manageable levels. However, that is not the same thing as taking it for granted. Nor is it inevitable that we return to our old selves and habits that were harmful to ourselves and others, or to putting others' needs behind our own. Instead, making good our vows to the Most High means to live a life appreciative of integrity. And that's what we've been talking about with our stewardship series, is that we are giving back to God out of thanksgiving, making sacrifices of thanksgiving. Various translations of Psalm 50, 14 translate make good as perform, fulfill, or pay. It indicates the fulfillment of our side of the relationship and to God's consistency to fulfill God's side of the relationship. Now, you remember last week we talked about the three times a year when all the Israelite men were required to travel to Jerusalem to come together and worship? At those worship meetings, God was, was renewing his covenant, his vow to the people. And what did the people vow back? To love the Lord their God alone with their whole beings. By reviewing their mutual vows, they were free to do what they were meant to do. Love and serve God, each other, and their neighbors. But... Without a regular agreed upon vow, without a regular review of these agreed upon vows, it's too easy to let the relationship drift from the actual to the theoretical. And what we're also seeing in Psalm 50 is God bringing charges against God's people. And looking at verse 7, once again, we're looking at those possessive pronouns. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am your God. 
So what charges is of God bringing against God's people? Well, the first charge we see is in verses 8 through 13. The first charge has to do with the charges of false worship of legalism. And this is what we were talking about with the kids. You know, they took those Ten Commandments. The people of Israel took the Ten Commandments and they broke them into all these laws. Go read through the Old Testament if you're really curious about what all those laws are. It's in Leviticus. Um, but those ten, those ten commandments were meant to keep it simple. And Jesus, when I talked to the kids, Jesus broke it down and made it even more simple. He's like, no, there's two. Two laws you have to do. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love others as yourselves. And God says, look, it's not that you fail to dot an I or to cross a T of the external obligations that were required of you. You have brought every sacrifice. You've brought it on time. I have nothing to say against you about that. But that's not the problem. What the problem is, God says, is that you seem to think that I need those sacrifices from you. You seem to think that I ate the flesh of wolves and I drank the blood of goats and I would go hungry unless you brought those sacrifices. So that if you brought them, you thought that was your duty discharged. That I was full and happy and satisfied. But I am not a God like that. And God says, even if I was hungry, I don't need to tell you about that. All the cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. I own every animal. You don't give me something I can't provide for myself. And I don't even need it. The point has never been that I needed those animals that you were offering as a sacrifice. The point is, I wanted you here, God says. And this is where legalism creeps into our heart. We think as long as we're doing those external things, we're checking off the boxes. You know what? People like lists. Even if you're not a type A personality, people like lists. Check those boxes off. We've gone through the motions. We're doing the things we're supposed to do, so we're satisfied. But God says, I don't rebuke you for doing that. I just don't care about it for its own sake. God wants us here, but God wants us here, present giving sacrifices of thanksgiving with our whole hearts, not just tossing in a ten in the offering plate because it's the right thing to do or somebody might be watching, but because out of our hearts we think, God has given me so much, I want to give back to God. It's saying, I'm going to give my time on Sunday morning to come worship God, not because God needs the worship, but because God desires to speak to me and spend that time with me. God wants our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength to turn to God in worship. God wants all of us, not just our external body. God wants those sacrifices of thanksgiving to come from our hearts, not out of obligation. And that's what legalism does. Legalism looks for loopholes. loopholes. We think, well, so long as I have dotted the I's and crossed the T's, I'm fine. But God says the external is easy. Don't want that. It's the internal that's hard, even impossible for you to do apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in you. So God first charges the people with the charge of false worship and legalism. The second charge in verses 14 to 15 is that God's people have failed to offer him true worship. And true worship, God summarizes, is prayer and praise. Look at verse 14. Here is what God instructs them to do. Instead, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. Now, isn't that God saying, well, you've given me your bulls and your goats, but what 
I really want is a different kind of animal sacrifice. No. He's not saying you haven't given me lambs or sparrows or grains or drink offerings. God's not saying that. God is saying it's not that they haven't physically brought God something that God needs. God's saying you haven't brought me the spirit of praise. Attitude in which you give, whether it is of your time, your talent, or your tithes, matters more than what or how much you are giving. You haven't responded to me from your soul for the salvation that I have given to you. That's what I want from you, to respond with the kind of thanksgiving that gives me glory in heaven for what I have done for you on earth. And then in verse 15, God says, I don't only want your praise, I also want your prayers. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. God says, I don't want you to look around. I don't want you to look to foreign nations to come to your aid. I don't want you to lean on your own military strength. I don't want you to lean on your own wisdom. God says, I want you to call upon me in the day of your trouble. God wants our prayer and our praise. And really everything we do in worship is at one of those ends of the spectrum. To call upon God for what we need, especially for the salvation we can only have in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then to praise God for what God has accomplished. Everything we needed and given far more abundant than we could ever think or imagine. And that is the sacrifices God requires of us. What God says then is that the first of all, you offered false worship of legalism, and second, as a consequence of that, you haven't offered true worship, the worship of your heart, of your soul, of your mind, of your strength engaged with me. You haven't given sacrifices of thanksgiving, true sacrifices. We are asked to give our time joyfully, not begrudgingly, not, oh man, it's Sunday, I gotta get up again. Not, oh, another meeting to attend. <laughs> we are asked to give our talents so that what God has given to us, we can return to God for the good of other people. We are asked to give of our tithes, as you have heard so often, you can't take it with you. In our covenant with God, God asks that we keep our vows to God. Our vow is to love God and to love each other more than we love our stuff, ourselves, or our money. God is faithful to us. Are we faithful to God? I invite you to stand as you are able to join in the statement of faith. I believe in truth. I believe in reality. Not captured in theory or in creed, but revealed to those who love. Because I believe, I trust.
accept the gifts we offer here today as mere tokens of our gratitude for the great gift of salvation which you have given to us. Amen. Now we come to a time of communion. And just a reminder, the responses are found on page 13 in front of the blue hymn.
Help us, O oh God, to love as Christ loved, knowing our own weakness, may we stand with all who stumble, sharing in his suffering, may we all remember, may we remember all who suffer. Held in his love, may we embrace all whom the world denies. Rejoicing in his forgiveness, may we forgive all who sin against us. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all ages we will feast with you at your table in glory, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, eternal God, now and forever. Amen. To the time for our service where we share with one another our joys and concerns. Do we have joys to lift up this morning? Yes, sir. Katie Bassel first tomorrow. Katie Bassel. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like Stenna. She's so happy that basketball practice has started. She said, volleyball practice took two hours. Basketball practice takes 15 minutes. <laughs> Let them preach the gospel boldly, 
to anyone who would listen. To those who are weighed down by guilt and sin, that they may be set free. We also ask your blessing upon society. For all those who work to bring justice and peace in this troubled world, grant, guide governments and leaders everywhere and inspire them, so that in all times and all places, your will may be done. Lord, we give you so many things that bring us joy, the basket, basketball season, rain, and the kids of our church. We give you thanks for a safe Halloween and that they're all here with us to worship today. Lord, we lift up to you, Becky and Jeremy, as they're on their mission trip, that it will be safe and fruitful, bringing your will, your peace, and your life to this world and to all those that they meet. Lord God, we trust by your spirit that you will always lead us forward in truth, guide us and lead us, so that your renewing word may give light to the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, our closing hymn this morning, is The Church's One Foundation, number 442, or on your screen.
May God bless you and keep you this day and every day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our benediction response for November is the chorus of victory in Jesus.